Lonnie Boulanger put it the best that I've ever heard it. She, she's one of the greatest teachers on the planet. She said, Quincy, your music can never be more or less than you are as a human being. That's, that's what your music's going to be, or, or anybody, or whatever you do. And she's right. So that makes the common denominator internationally. You know, when, wherever we go, if we go to Indonesia or, or Singapore or, or China, Korea will blow your head off, man. You think you're in, in, in Stony Island, man. It's got, I said, man, teach me some Korean. They said, Mo, 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 Fo. I said, what? <laughs> it's just like being in Chicago, man. It's so authentic. And, and China thinks that the rap came from, from Korea. <laughs> just like Chicago, man. kids from Stony Island. The movie didn't talk about race, but it, it just shattered the, the myth of race in, in the urban city by just saying, look, people are just trying to like hurdle their differences and trying to get something done and trying to trying to dig this, this thing that they do together. That's what the movie got to. It's rarely told how people come together and drop their differences and line up with their similarities in music and culture. It's rarely told there, like it is in sports. It's always like, okay, you guys are all on the same team. We're gonna try to win the game. You have a coach that guides them. And all. That story has been told a thousand times, but when it comes down to the music, this is a similar story. And it's told in a time where there's still a lot of paranoia in the air. There's still a lot of paranoia today, but back then, 1978, it was clearly like, you know, Black guys over here, white guys over here. You know, the Jewish kids can't hang with the white guys because it was, it was crazy, it was stupid. So seeing Stony Island, I was like, wow. It's like, you know, we all come together. Uh, these, these people in the neighborhood, there's trouble everywhere, but music can actually bring people together and bring up a great spirit of, of a cultural language where people know that they are, they are as one. Stony Island is really a tribute to my parents and who they were as human beings and how they raised their kids. My mom and pop met in the theater. They were young, young people during the Depression. They were surrounded by Studs Terkel and Haskell Wexler and all kinds of interesting people doing political left-wing theater. And we grew up on the south side of Chicago, basically, in an area that was built for GIs after World War II. It was called South Daring, South Chicago at the end of an area called Stony Island, which was near the University of Chicago. So the whole south side of Chicago became my playground as a kid. My parents had a baby much later in life. He wasn't an accident. My mother and father wanted to have another child. He was 11 years younger than I. His name's Richard, and I had an older sister named Joe. And we basically raised Richie together, the four of us. As I went off to college, he wound up staying in a neighborhood that was changing, was becoming a black neighborhood. It went from 100% white to 98% black in 18 months. And they decided to stay. Their politics were such that they really felt they were not going to be part of the white flight and run. He was raised in that community, and uh, he initially told us that uh, it was a little touchy at first when the neighborhood started to change. But once the neighborhood went pretty much all black, he felt very comfortable. And for many years, I think he thought he was black, not white. When the neighborhood was all white, it wasn't like it was not a tough neighborhood. It was tough, Serbian and Croatian tough. You know, think Mike Ditka and Dick Butkus tough. And those guys didn't necessarily like Jewish people, of which I am one. And as a result, I had plenty of fear from the tough white guys in the neighborhood. So when the black guys moved in, I had an instant ally. And by the time the neighborhood was all black, I was sort of given, for lack of a, of a better term, a ghetto pass, because they knew that I was down with them from the moment they moved in. So I couldn't necessarily use that pass in any other neighborhood, but in my neighborhood, I was cool. For people who don't know, Stony Island is a street that runs through the east side, south side of Chicago. It em embraces a lot of neighborhoods. 
The University of Chicago it was right in the middle of, of the South Side, surrounded by steel mills, black neighborhoods, Slavic neighborhoods, Mexican neighborhoods. It was a real mess of a wonderful humanity. If you think about the migration from the South, you know, because everybody's from Chicago is either from Alabama or Mississippi mainly, and when they migrated to the North, you know, Chicago was the number one stop. So it has that combination of all of the very strong southern roots of blues and so forth mixed with jazz. 63rd and Stony Island is where Louis Armstrong got off the Illinois central city of New Orleans when he came to Chicago. And blocks away from there were great clubs. It was like the Harlem of, of the South Side. And that's where Muddy Waters and Bo Diddley and Chuck Berry and all those people came and established themselves. And where the Chess Brothers, who were also immigrants from Poland, had a club and a bar on the South Side that became the, the big basis of chess records. On my block, the great arranger Richard Evans, around the corner, the great gospel singer Jesse Dixon, uh, one of the uh, Count Basie's top trumpet players lived in, uh, around there. Gene Krupa, Steve Allen, Mel Torme, Herbie Hancock, Shaka Khan, Common, Kanye West, Maurice White. A little Milton lived not too far. Tyrone Davis used to live over there somewhere. The uh, uh, Curtis Mayfield didn't live too far from where I lived. Jake Chess lived on, on Jeffrey Boulevard about five or six blocks uh, parallel to Stony Island Avenue. So the, it goes on and on and on, the effects and the influence of people who lived in and around Stony Island Avenue. Chicago, although heavily segregated in many aspects, you're, you're integrated by transit default, you know? And in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, uh, no place had a musical language such as Chicago. I graduated from college and worked in 1968 on Medium Cool with Haskell Wexler, who became my mentor. And having a relationship with a guy like this was a great difference in my life. And I, and I think that one of the things that's very important that I learned from the experience of coming out of school in 68, working on the riots during the Democratic Convention for Haskell's movie, was how to do a kind of raw street kind of shooting. It was not about Hollywood formality. It was about how do you be this kind of neorealistic cinema verite cameraman who could capture honest kind of stuff. I had seen American Graffiti. I had seen Marty Scorsese's Mean Streets, and I said, these are directors who made films about where they grew up and what their lives were about. And I said, I'm going to do one about where I grew up. I've been taking pictures of my brother growing up in the neighborhood and taking pictures at his high school and understood the whole milieu of his relationship to these kids he was involved with music with. And I said, Richie, you know, if I ever get this movie together, you should be the lead in it. I met a woman named Tamar Hoffs while I was shooting a movie called Lefke. It was a big Hollywood movie for me. It was shot in Panavision with Tony Curtis, Milton Berle. I met this woman who was one of the co-writers who was also from Chicago, whose brother was a, a musician similar to my brother, who was a kid who was lost in the blues. It was a white kid who had fallen in love with Muddy Waters and all of the great blues players on the south side of Chicago. So Tammy and I sat down and began working on a screenplay. He had stories to tell me that were like my own biography, especially the story of our brothers, which was unique in our close association. At the time we made Stony Island, there may be six or seven independent feature films made in the whole country. It was an exciting time for independent filmmakers and for people who were going to go to film festivals with their movies and, and bring their movies to the public in a new way. The financing and the making of Stony Island was really a family affair, literally. Um, friends of our family, friends of Tammy's family, pooled together, put some money in, found other people who were willing to take a chance on a movie about kids and music. Now, going to them and actually asking for money was, you know, a little courageous on our part. We had a real amalgam of humanity investing from some very wealthy people to people who could hardly afford to buy the $6,000 points. We raised $300,000 and we went off to make a movie in Chicago. People really just wanted to see this kid's dream, who's 28 years old, come true. A guy named Chuck Stepner was working at CBS in Los Angeles and he, he knew about the project and he introduced me to a fellow named Gene Barge. 
He was the father of country soul sax playing. He was uh, with Chuck Willis on C.C. Ryder. He was Gene Barge's Daddy G with Gary and the U.S. Bonds. And he was really well respected. He worked at Stax Records, came to Chicago, produced for chess, and had his own records out. Dr. King expressed to me many times how his favorite version of Precious Lord was with Gene Barge on a tenor sax solo, you know. He talked about that all the time. That was his favorite tune. And his rhythm section was Donny Hathaway, Maurice White, Phil Upchurch, and Minnie Ripperton sang backgrounds. Plus, he produced Muddy Waters, both in his blues era and also he did Electric Mud. So Gene was now working, uh, as he always did, as a ranger and a producer, and he was working so well with young musicians. And I met him, and he agreed to be in the movie. And so we started putting the cast together. And after I met Richie Davis and looked at his uh, demeanor and age, and I said, well, we got to match up young uh, musicians who were very good, guys like Larry Ball, Tennyson Stevens, Kenny Brass, Edwin Williams, Donnell Hagan, and uh, Chris Johnson. We looked around, and uh, we ended up with a really good band. Gene got us to do this movie. We met all these other wonderful people from California, and it was really, really like a party. We basically threw this group of people together that created a band within three weeks of studio musicians and street kids, wrote a bunch of songs, and, uh, and that became the basis of the band. We had a rehearsal studio on diversity that was for the most part occupied by my friends and, and myself jamming. And it was at the height of jazz fusion. Everyone was posing, playing way too many notes, and I thought that we were just fantastic. And then Gene came in with Larry Ball, Donnie Hagan, Tennyson Stevens, and Chris Johnson. And they sat down, and there was a lot of staff there at the time milling around doing their thing who never paid much attention to us, and I can see why. And they sat down and they started playing Way Back Home by the Crusaders. And first thing I noticed is all the people came to hear, oh wow, this is like some real music. And I was observing the whole thing, taking it in, and it was the first time I'd ever sat next to a drummer. I heard records, I heard on the radio, but this first time I was sat, sat next to someone, even could have seen someone in concert maybe, who was just playing the pocket, who was just playing the part. I said, wow, so that's what it looks like to what it sounds like on the radio. I get it, I get it, okay. I, was, I had started going to UC Berkeley. I had started my first quarter there, and suddenly I get this call from my mom saying, the movie's, we're, we're making it. I don't know how, but we're going to make it. It's low budget, but we're going to do it. Get on a plane and get over here. You'll be a PA. You'll have a part. You'll get to see what it's like to make a low budget movie in the winter in Chicago. So that's what happened. It was sort of like this big commune or something that occurred. We were all sort of living together, the cast and crew. So we had three production companies um, housing their actors in one hotel. Um, and that is a recipe for not sleeping ever. Radon Chong, she and I hit it off really well, and um, all of the musicians were just so friendly, and it was just such a warm environment that it didn't even seem like we were doing a movie, really. The first person I think I met besides Andy Davis was his brother Richie, and we, we actually hit it off <laughs> right away and had almost a little romance going on. I just thought Susie was the cutest thing in the world, and I just fell madly in love with her. And I was, you know, 19 and didn't have a clue what that really meant. And Ray Dawn, wonderful. I was in love with her, too. I was in love with anybody. I was 19, you know. And I remember meeting Dana's friends, and we were in a hallway, and he was telling us how he was going to be a big movie star. And he was right. He became a big star. It was awesome. Hey, this kid, sometimes they don't know what they're getting, you know? I wanted the poorest kid in the group to be a, a, a hillbilly uh, musician, a kid who was struggling more than even the black kids, which came out of Haskell Wexler's Medium Cool. There's a character by the name of Harold, and I named our, our same character Harold after Haskell's character. And we found George Anglin. Tammy Hoffs knew this kid who grew up in, in, in Brentwood, California. George was really amazing because, so okay, so this is Cloris Leachman's son, right? 
and Gene Barge, the famous Daddy G, who pretty much invented rock and roll saxophone, arguably, you know, him and King Curtis. I think I overheard the conversation saying, that, you know what, I don't get it. This just blows all my theories. This is a kid who grew up in wherever, is it Bel Air or wherever they grew up, and he's got more soul you know, where does he get this from, you know? And George is an amazing saxophone player. They welcomed me in as a foreigner from California. I was the uh, surfer kid there. I didn't realize how major these cats were, you know, and it, they were very low key, but when we started playing, I could tell that they were, you know, real serious players. George, during the movie, I didn't know you were rich. That's what I was saying. It's like really. I, I thought you were just a poor kid I and had a too. funny accent. I did. And then, the yeah, I did too. Then I say, wow, it's man, this part. guy is like, you know, like like me. You know, we're both poor. You know, like <laughs> you're a good actor. Good actor. Because yeah. I didn't know either. Then I moved to California and, 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 and this is Lawrence Leachman's son. Oh my God. I say, wow, George, man, you're my best buddy. <laughs> Gene, in particular, mentored me. You know, he really uh, took me under his wing and. Uh, helped me, so it was a great experience. But you know, I used to lead the rehearsal quite a bit, and these were incredible players. And here I was, you know, a kid, the kid from the, my character. I'll take it. Conducting this incredible <laughs> bunch of players, it was it was quite wonderful. Stoney Robinson was singing on army bases when he was 14 years old. He moved to Chicago, and my brother met him. He lived down the block from Richie. He was like a young Lou Rawls, a young James Brown. He would always be singing and dancing and showing his wares for anybody that would listen, you know. And he would perform for uh, uh, one person as if it was 5,000 people. That was always his attitude. And, uh, you know, I used to think it was a show-off. Man, why are you showing off so much, you know? But that was just his nature, you know? He loved performing. I found out later I didn't know he could sing like he could sing. I, I, uh, I thought he was just being used as an actor in this movie, but it turns out this, this, this guy could sing. Stony Island for him was just a joy ride. I remember him, but what was a hotel? You kept him in a hotel downtown because you wanted to make sure that he, someone could find him in the morning. And he would say, Richie, man, I just can't believe it. You know, I just look, I just look at the ceiling at night and go, I can't believe I'm in where he was, the Drake or wherever it was. You know, he, he, was, he, he already had his dialogue ready for Johnny Carson. You know, his, he had already visualized his interview on Tonight Show. If you look at a film like The Commitments, where they were able to take pop songs, top songs, and, and get the rights to re-record them, I knew I never had the money to do that. So we had to write our own music. I said to Stoney, I said, listen, here's what we'll do. Let's write this song. It'll go something like this. There's a band that's the greatest band that I am. It's the Stony Island band. There's no greater band. So, and, and then he put those exact same stupid lyrics that I was just making up and sang them. I couldn't believe it. He was a very skillful and talented person. And to me, it, 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 was, it was trying to write the best kind of music with a variety of styles possible, but also feel like it was real, like it was a band coming together. It wasn't totally slick. I heard Ronnie Barron, who plays uh, uh, Ronnie Roosevelt, on a Paul Butterfield album, and he did this incredible falsetto New Orleans kind of vamp song called Broke My Baby's Heart. And I said, I gotta have this guy. I thought he was black, and it turns out he was white. And I thought, how cool to have the next of kin of Percy Price, Gene Barge's character, be a white guy from New Orleans. I don't believe you died on the snow, no. I believe you're just gonna make a gig up in the master's mansion in our heavenly home. The music was being passed from one generation to another, from a black man to a white man and back again to some black kids. Now, now Ronnie, I didn't know if he was black or white. <laughs> right. yeah. Because, I mean, this guy was so soulful. I mean, he was cool, soulful, 
I mean, I really love Lonnie Barron. I think Ronnie Barron was the reason Dr. John became Dr. John because in their early days in New Orleans, uh, they got in a fight over a woman in some kind of way. Uh, Dr. John was a guitar player. He lost a finger, a part of a finger, a digit on the finger, and that made him switch to piano. I really got to know him very well, and to, and to work with him was a fantastic experience. And he really was the original Dr. John. Dr. John got all that stuff from Ronnie. You know my people back home, down in New Orleans, they know how to deal with somebody like Mr. Moss. Well, yeah, they do. They give him a lizard death when he least expected. Drop some lizard eggs in his Coca-Cola. And before you know it, lizards come out of his mouth. Somebody say, hey, man, you got snakes in your legs. You got eggs in your head. Cat die real fast behind that. What a wonderful pianist that a lot of people would overlook because of his demeanor and shyness and was Tennyson Stevens. And, uh, and he, he would surprise people because of, he was so good, but he was laid back and quiet, and he wouldn't expect all this music to come out of this fella, but better still, he was an excellent singer. No one stays the same. The young become the old. The crew was very small. The Grip Electric crew on Stony Island consisted of four people. Many of were friends of mine who had worked on earlier films together. Tak Fujimoto, who had been my assistant, became our cinematographer. We had two cameras, Tack shot one, I shot the other. We shot all the music live in 12 days. Nothing was overdubbed. Every single note you see was recorded on location. We had a remote truck from Detroit, a 16-track, 2-inch remote truck. Uh, Richard Goodman recorded the music with the help of Tom Holman. Tom was a college classmate of mine who invented THX and is now the head of uh, audio for Apple. We had a lot of fun. We all worked together, and there was no hierarchy. Everybody was equal. That was one of the great things about the movie. And I heard my daughter Susanna say that she was a PA and she was also an actress. And I didn't see that as meaning that it was awkward or, or funny. It was like, that's what it was. You were a PA and an actor. You were a mother and you were also the, the producer. Titles didn't mean anything on that, uh, on that movie, and I have learned so much from that. It was really guerrilla filmmaking. I mean, it was like indie. I mean, I don't even remember if there was a studio attached. All I know was we were, you know, setting up the craft service table and, you know, moving everything ourselves. Everybody did everything. It was, a, it was a kind of a wonderful experience, I gotta say. We were very lucky, you know, the, the, the wet streets at night when we were driving, the glistening of things, the weather played in our favor. Look at this, downtown Chicago. Chicago's a nice town if you're looking for a pizza. We were taking a sequence of Richie and Susie walking through the zoo together, and I wanted, they were falling in love, and uh, I, I was, we were watching these two lions, and I panned over from Richie and Susie, and just as I panned over for them sort of being nice to each other and nodding to each other, the lions came out and kissed each other. I heard a David Sanborn album called Taking Off, and it was produced and written by David Matthews. I heard this kind of Aaron Copeland, big city urban sound. I said, that's what the score should sound like. It had great kind of energy and heart and warmth. So um, after the movie was, was shot, I went to David uh, Matthews and I said, will you do the score? And he, he didn't quite know what to make of it. You know, he, this movie was in pieces and, he's, and I convinced him to do it. And uh, it worked out really well. He got David Sanborn to play. I've actually only been starstruck one time in my life. I grew up around Paul Newman and Marlon Brando and people like that. And one time <clears throat> I sat in with Michael Ruff who was uh, Dave Sanborn's keyboard player. He said, come down, sit in. Uh, Sanborn's playing the first set, you play the second set. So there's a little tiny green room in this place that was on Wilshire. 
and I went in there, and Dave's packing up, and I'm setting up, and I said, <laughs> I just, you know, I really got giddy because I, I was so impressed with him. It was great that he was kind of my personality, the voice of my character in the film. The movie was shot, and we came back to California, and I hired Dove Honig, who was my dear friend, and he was the guy I trusted, so I said, Dove, you cut the movie. He said, yes. And Mary McGlone, my, my girlfriend, and Dove worked on the cutting of the movie. And by the time I finished the movie, the couple of teenage movies, music movies had failed, and there wasn't that much interest in it. Fox actually gave me some money to do some editing, and we tested the movie, and they brought these kids from the inner city in to see it, and they told them, don't make any noise. Stay, sit in your seats and be very quiet. And Fox wanted the kids to be freaking out and screaming out, and they were told by their teachers not to. So that didn't work. The film was shown to a company called World Northall, and they bought the movie. They paid for almost the whole negative cost of the movie, and uh, it was released to rave reviews, both nationally and locally. And what happened is white kids started going to the theater, and then black kids started joining them, and the theater owners got scared that they were going to lose their audience. So they pulled the movie, and we were devastated. We didn't know what to do. And they said, well, we're going to release it as a black exploitation movie, and they, they changed the title from Stony Island to My Main Man from Stony Island. My Main Man from Stony Island, a musical adventure film to turn you on. It's cool. It's hip. It's a bunch of dudes who could have become a street gang. Instead, they become a rock band. And the film went out, and it wasn't really, it wasn't an exploitation movie. And it, it came out, and, it's, and that was it. It was over. It was a calling card for me. I was invited to Deauville to go to the Festival uh, of American Cinema. I went as the young, fair-haired, uh, I had hair in those days, fair-haired uh, director. I went to the Salt Lake City Film Festival, which was the precursor to Sundance, with four or five other independent filmmakers invited to the Aspen Institute as the young independent filmmaker. And uh, it became my career. When Stony Island had been out for a little while and the reality was setting in that this might not really happen the way Stony kind of dreamt it would, he couldn't, he couldn't keep away the darkness. It, it sort of consumed him, and it was, it was sad to see. And, but I remember I would call him and check on him, and a few times I called and checked on him, I could tell that things weren't right. And that's when I got the call that he had died and found out that he had a liver condition that was manageable, that could have been treated, but he was just self-medicating. He was so far out that in, there was no one really taking care of him but himself, and he couldn't take care of himself. And he just, he just, he just kind of faded out. I think that's one of the reasons why it's so nice that this film is going to be re-released, to just sort of just see that moment in time with this boy, this boy from this, from this bad neighborhood, this troubled youth in the South Side, and. Uh, you know, so many struggles in his childhood, and then this, the dream was so strong in him, and his excitement about things was so huge, and I don't know, he was a big personality. And when I heard that he had died, it was a major loss, you know, it was a, just a sadness that uh, that talent was no more. When we finished the movie, I knew that he was gonna go on to great heights, not knowing that, uh, not too long later, he would uh, pass away, but I just thought he was a great talent. He came out to California, and I said, oh, Stoney, if you become famous, you're going to be dangerous. You know, unfortunately, he didn't get a chance to be famous. He's remembered in this movie, and this is a real tribute to this really wonderful, talented kid. Stoney Island, when I, when I first saw it, it kind of had some of those same elements from a city whose story hadn't been told for a long time. It wasn't a major media center like New York and L.A., which was, you know, all of a sudden a pebble comes out, out of Brooklyn and it could strike, you know, Wall Street or a stone can come from uh, South Central and, and, and bust the window of Hollywood. Another thing that was powerful in the movie to me is Gene Barge's character of a person who has the experience, he has the know-how, he has the ability to bring people together like, like Gene does in real life but then respected, not respected because he got a lot of money, 
not respected because he got a lot of things. He's respected because he's actually communicating to young people on how to just, you know, do their thing and love it, enjoy it, and have it also be karma to the rest of the world that surrounds them. And that's why I got all that. Because, you know, I mean, to, to have everybody looking up to this older black man was a, was a statement. It was such a diverse time for music. I mean, you had the Rolling Stones and Led Zeppelin, you had James Taylor and Carole King, and you had punk rock, and you had, you know, Stevie Wonder, you know? So it was like, somehow in, in, in all of that mix, you know, I found my own voice. But I, I, I do feel that, that working on Stony Island had something to do with it. When I got the opportunity to be in Stony Island, you know, um, it kind of represented my family because I was that poor kid trying to make it, you know, trying to get a break. That was one thing I felt great about doing that music because I did get a break. I think that that movie was our story before a story really transpired. Most of all of those people in that movie have been very successful in the arts, whether it's acting or singing or playing an instrument. And I think that um, Andy Davis had an eye for pulling people together. Working with Andy Davis, uh, whenever I've had, you know, one of these wonderful little parts that he gets me, uh, he'll kind of stand in front of me and I look down at him a little bit and he kind of holds my hand and says, okay, what are you going to say now? You know, and we kind of go over the stuff, you know. And those are some of the most wonderful memories I have of any movie I've worked in was kind of working out my lines with Andy. And I never went back to school, much to the, you know, horror of my mother who, who thought that I would maybe be a doctor or something like that. But the irony is, is even though I didn't become a doctor, what I do now is heal people. And I heal myself through music. And that it, it's the most wonderful thing when we play open to the public dates in Chicago where there's such a cross section you have Italian tourists and kids from the ghetto and college kids and seniors and everything all there. And for two hours, they drop whatever their hangups are for two hours, and everyone just totally just releases. And that's the most satisfying thing in the world. And there's no doubt that we're doing a social service. Now, I didn't plan on this, but this is just sort of results. So in a funny kind of way, I did what my mom always wanted me to do, is you know, help people out. Well, Stony Island and uh, my brother Edward Stoney Robinson, the work uh, that you guys have done uh, actually is um, very meaningful to me because it's the last and only uh, thing that I have of him. And so, you know, it means a lot to us as a, as a family. You're the only person I know that does a floor show for everyone on the L platform. The whole world is a stage. It's obvious. Larry Bow, I'm the kid from Stony Island. I'm Susanna Hobbs, and I'm a kid from Stony Island. I'm George England, and I'm a kid from Stony Island. I'm Richie Davis, and I'm a kid from Stony Island. Come and see Stony Island um, and experience a part of Chicago and a part of Chicago's history that is gone, that you won't ever see again.
Quincy Jones, another little rug rat from Stony Island. <laughs>